Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Brode. I'm a general internist physician and the medical director of the post-COVID-19 program at UT Health Austin, which is part of Dell Medical School at the University of Texas. And so today I really wanna talk about long COVID, um, what we know about the illness taking care of patients, and also what the emerging science is telling us about this. And so to start with, we first need to recognize that post-viral symptoms or illnesses are not new. We've seen them with previous pandemics going back to the 1890s Russian influenza, um, with people being affected with diffuse and neurologic symptoms following viral illness. So the first major question is really, what is a virus that we've never seen on this scale in modern times versus what is specific to COVID-19? And there probably overlaps with both can cause similar symptoms. And so within that though, the terms and the definitions are not concrete yet. The um, NIH wants us to call this post-acute sequelae of COVID-19, also known as PASC. Most press uh, and science articles will also call it long COVID. The CDC wants us to call it post-COVID conditions and patients themselves may uh, refer to themselves as long haulers. Right now, there's no medical or consensus definition, um, but for the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna refer to it as PASC and long COVID and use those terms interchangeably. And so when does long COVID or PASC actually start? Well, it actually shows that the initial illness can last up to four weeks. For most people, symptoms rapidly improve over the first four weeks. You can have ongoing symptomatic COVID from four to 12 weeks. That healing slows down between that period. And it's really long COVID. Most people agree when it's more than 12 weeks because that's when the healing process and the symptoms uh, start to linger and the healing slows down, although these numbers aren't exact. And so first we're gonna talk a little bit about the initial COVID-19 illness which is really a few phases. The first being a viral phase, uh, really uh, a virus-like illness with fever, cough, uh, chills, the loss of smell and taste, which is specific to COVID. Um, but for most people heal during that phase and get completely better, but there is a small portion that will go on to be hospitalized. And that's really having an overactive immune system characterized by high inflammation and unfortunately for the people who get really sick, uh, having diffuse um, damage to their organs, usually from inflammation and clotting. So, you know, our treatments are really targeted towards those stages. In the viral stage, preventing the virus from replicating early on in the illness. And by the time they get to the hospital, really trying to tamp down the immune system with different medications. So what happens though, if that immune system or that damage is ongoing and becomes long COVID. I think the first thing is that the reported symptoms of long COVID are almost dizzying. There's been so many uh, described. One paper said 50, another paper found more than 100, and not to be outdone, this paper identified 203 different symptoms of long COVID, which can make this a little bit overwhelming. And so to try to break it down, I think of long COVID as really three groups of symptoms. The first being damage to the organs that we can measure on our standard tests. And that's almost exclusively in patients who were hospitalized and really had severe critical illness that required them to be in the hospital. You know, this can be lung fibrosis or scarring of the lungs, damage to the kidneys and heart, or PTSD from that hospital experience. And it actually showed uh, in one study that the more sick you were, the more likely you were to have lung damage. Two thirds of people who were in the ICU, about one third of people who were just uh, getting oxygen on a regular hospital floor. But actually most people who never required hospitalization do not have lung damage on the tests that we have. So the next group of symptoms is really persistent viral lingering symptoms, which we've seen in other viruses too. This could just be cough, having difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, headaches, muscle aches, um, or persistently losing your sense of smell, which is common in COVID. And that can be affecting a lot of people too. 
The next part is, I think, what gets a lot of attention and makes a lot of people scratch their head along with their physicians. And I'll put those symptoms into the category of their immune system is not working properly, it is overreactive, there's inflammation, and also to their autonomic nervous system, the part of the nervous system that controls all the autonomic features, that's the digestive system, that is sweating, heart rate, blood pressure, doesn't work properly. And so you get this long list of symptoms, including problems with the GI system, nerve pain, hives, rash, dizziness, balance issues, ringing in the ears, which is called tinnitus. And for some people, that nervous system problem also causes anxiety or problems with regulating their temperature. So within that though, those are the three categories of symptoms, but almost every person who comes into our clinic will have fatigue, brain fog, and post-exertional malaise. And it seems like those three are very clearly related. The worst uh, the fatigue is, the worst people's brain fog and thinking is, and a lot of the problems of people's brain fog is really concentration and attention, which is related to fatigue. And it's almost if the battery is not as full as it used to be, and both mental exertion, physical exertion, or even um, emotional exertion can cause post-exertional malaise, which is this medical term for if you do an activity that should not be tiring, it just wears you out, out of proportion, and makes all your symptoms worse. As if, you know, if you drain the battery too much, you pay for it, and all the different activities can pull from the battery that's not as full as it used to be. So for some people, that fatigue, brain fog, and post-exertional malaise is long COVID, but they may have other parts of these symptoms depending if they were hospitalized or their risk factors. And so how many people actually have long COVID? And that's a really important question. This study done by the Veterans Administration showed that uh, about 7% total people who have COVID end up developing long COVID at six months. And it was clear that the people who were hospitalized in the ICU, uh, about 37% of people were affected, less so if you just required uh, oxygen. And then for people who were never hospitalized, it was around 4%. I will say though that the CDC recently put out an excellent study and they put that number even higher at about 20%. So one in five people who have COVID go on to develop lingering symptoms at about six months. And with the variants, it is not clear uh, how many people are gonna develop long COVID or PASC, but a new study showed that about 11% of people with the Delta variant developed long COVID. And still about four and a half percent of people with the Omicron variants are developing long COVID. And so, based on how contagious this is, that is a lot of people. So putting that in scale, you know, if we estimate, which is a pretty conservative estimate, about 90 million people in the United States have had COVID infections. If you take the very conservative estimate, which is on the lower uh, of all the numbers I've given you at 7%, that's 6 million people who are still suffering from this illness. That's a huge amount of people who have not recovered from COVID-19. And within that too, high rates of disability. Uh, a recent report said that there's over a million people out of the workforce because of long COVID, which is gonna have a lot of impact on our economy and policy in the United States. And so, you know, within these symptoms, what it becomes clear though, is that this illness for some people can be a chronic fatigue syndrome with the brain fog, fatigue, and post-exertional malaise. But, you know, in those groups, it, long COVID kind of gets lumped in as a post-ICU syndrome from severe illness requiring hospitalization, kind of a post-viral syndrome, which shares a lot of features with other viruses. And then, of course, the one with all these weird neurologic symptoms, almost this neuroinflammatory syndrome, which seems to predominantly affecting younger people who were not hospitalized. And so within that too, you know, the data shows um, that the recovery process, most people are having a continued and persistent recovery. 
Um, and it does seem that that post-exertional malaise, that idea that if you do too much, you make all your symptoms worse through exertion, once that starts to go away, almost all the symptoms start to go away. Um, and that really makes it show that this is probably fundamental to the illness in this uh, research article presented here. And I will say, you know, as scientists and doctors, we are trying to research this and come up with cures, and we're working closely with patients who are organized, advocating for themselves, and forming online groups. Here are a few here. It's been a really important partnership to understanding this disease and developing treatments. And so, who is getting long COVID and what's happening uh, on the cellular level with the science? So, uh, the risk factors developing long COVID are a few things. The first category is the sicker you are with COVID, the more likely are you are to have your symptoms persist. That makes sense. And so the risk factors are the sicker you are at the beginning, the more symptoms you have, and also the risk factors for getting very sick in the first place. So higher age, higher body mass index, higher rates of virus in your blood when you initially get sick. The other category is less obvious, and it seems to be more uh, bound to people's innate immune response. So we have found that people who have existing autoimmune antibodies in their body go on to develop long COVID, especially in the patients who are not hospitalized. Interestingly, women seem to be more predisposed to autoimmune disorders and they're also getting long COVID more than men. Within that, having asthma or other lung condition predisposes to lingering symptoms. And then a very interesting one, Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, which is the virus that causes mononucleosis. There has been one study that showed that when patients initially got COVID, if that virus were to escape and reactivate in the blood, people were more likely to have lingering symptoms. It's unclear if EBV was causing long COVID directly or if it just got loose as part of that dysregulated immune response. Um, but it's a very certain interesting thing that scientists are looking at. I will note though, when they followed up that same group of patients at three months from their illness, nobody had persistent viral replication or EBV reactivation in their blood at three months, even though they had lingering symptoms. So within that still, our best tool to preventing long COVID is vaccination. The studies estimate that it can reduce the rate of developing long COVID by at least 50%, although that range has gone from 15 to 80%. It clearly reduces the risk of severe disease, which is the number one risk factor of developing long COVID. And so, you know, it should be noted that and the initial COVID-19 illness is not a lung disease, it's a disease throughout the whole body and can affect all organs, which we're seeing in long COVID. And so some of the theories uh, for what is happening to the body in long COVID fall into a couple categories. The first being direct damage to the organs, either from the virus, from lack of oxygen, um, or scarring from the virus. The other one follows into that, usually in people who are hospitalized, does the virus cause ongoing autoimmunity, meaning the body is attacking itself and, or tricking the body into attacking itself? The other one is, does the virus just kind of rev up the immune system so there's this chronic low-level inflammation that is contributing to the symptoms? Um, and lastly, one of the main theories, is there persistent virus in the body hiding and we can't find it, or are there viral fragments in the body? There's been some evidence to suggest that viral fragments can stick around, but most people believe that the virus is eradicated, although we're still open-minded if it could be hiding out in the body. So I will say uh, the research is emo emerging quickly. It's a fire hose of information. And these are really small studies that give us interesting clues. But to really say anything definitive, we're going to have to take those small studies and look at larger populations to confirm what's going on. And so this article was fantastic. Uh, but once again, more hypothesis generating, as we say, and not definitive. But a few of the themes that have really interested me about what's happening in the body are four right here, um, which I think are pretty interesting. First of all, there does seem to be 
chronic inflammation on the central nervous system in the brain. Uh, it's almost the same, looks very similar to chemotherapy on the brain or chemo brain, this kind of chronic stress reaction and high rates of inflammation in the nervous system. Within that, we're also seeing a very interesting study took young healthy people who got COVID and had lingering symptoms and they put them on an exercise machine and it showed that their heart and lungs pumped the blood well, it oxygenated the blood, but in the microcirculation, there was inefficiency in extracting that oxygen. We don't know exactly why, but it does seem that there's a problem with the microcirculation of getting the blood flow to the right place at the right time, um, which has been very interesting because people feel symptomatic in their heart or lungs, but it may not actually be what the problem is. It may be in the circulation itself. And within that, we're seeing some people with having the neurologic and nervous system problems have trouble, uh, have damage to their small fiber nerves. These are the nerves that regulate the autonomic nervous system, all those things we talked about, blood flow, heart rate, the GI system. And it's very interesting because uh, a little bit of the chicken and the egg, both the microcirculation feeds those nerves and those nerves regulate the microcirculation. And so we're not sure exactly where the problem is, but it seems that once again, getting the blood flow to the right place at the right time with those nerves and circulation seem to be disrupted. And lastly, you know, there is a lot of concern of, is there persistent viral fragments that are causing the body to have high inflammation? Uh, or is this the Epstein-Barr virus that is uh, once again tricking the body into having chronic inflammation? We don't know yet, but it's a theory that we're really looking into. And so finally, what about getting treatment? Uh, when should you uh, get treatment for long COVID and what's important to think about? I think the first thing is, you know, this is a new disease. We're trying to find targeted curative therapies, but the science is still early, but it's evolving quickly. And so the AAPMNR is publishing consensus statements about how to treat it, recommend that your doctor read those and stay up to date. And the CDC also has some basic guidance for getting treatment. But in our clinic, how do I approach all patients? Uh, I think I have a, the first step is of course, believe them. This is definitely an illness affecting huge amounts of people. And they all tell me the same thing. They're having fatigue, they push through and it makes them feel worse. And they're having neurologic symptoms. Uh, not everybody is making this up. And so we're seeing the same things over and over. This is clearly affecting many people. And so the first step of taking care of patients, I believe them. And especially because this seems to be affecting women or people of color predominantly and the medical community, we've uh, historically not believed them. And I think it's just important to believe the patient and meet them where they're at. Secondly, though, you know, as the COVID-19 virus becomes more common and more people are infected, we shouldn't forget that diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, even cancer are common. And so it's important to talk to your primary care to doctor to get a general health screening and make sure there's not another cause of these symptoms because the virus is so common and it's not caused by another health problem. Within that though, if you did have COVID and there's not another explanation, for people who were hospitalized, it's important to really check to make sure there's no scarring of the lungs or other body parts from being so sick. But for most people uh, who are not hospitalized, we don't have a test for long COVID. And so the workup for a lot of these tests is coming back normal, which is okay. And we should have a limited workup uh, for those people without getting lots of tests because we don't have a test specifically for long COVID yet. Within that too, I would say that anxiety is part of long COVID, is part of that neurologic response and depression is part of being alive over the last couple years of the pandemic. And so at the end of the day, it's just important to treat people and their mental health symptoms so they are primed and in the best headspace they can for recovery. And within that, really recognizing that people's health-related social needs, their ability to pay rent, take care of themselves, go to work are extremely important. And we need to care for the whole person in order to put them on the best steps to recovery. Next, as we talked about, the fatigue, brain fog, and post-exertional malaise are really central to the disease. And so a lot of the 
strategies for coping with long COVID are about managing the energy. How do you use it when you have it, resting when you need it, and not pushing through to make yourself worse? Within that too, you know, you don't want to have this cycle of getting worse and worse and losing muscle mass and getting more fatigued. And so you do need to do some exercises, preferably with a physical therapist or someone to help you guide you through that to slowly recondition, threading that needle of gaining more muscle mass, getting in better shape, but not causing that post-exertional malaise and hitting that wall. And lastly, you know, in the absence of targeted curative treatments, which of course uh, is being researched across the United States, uh, we're finding that this energy management, counseling on how to cope and recover with the illness is extremely important and that almost everybody is recovering over time. It's slowly but surely uh, we found significant recovery in almost all patients, usually from six months to a year to 18 months and other post-viral illnesses, the recovery period has been from one to three years, but most people are getting better. And if you're having severe symptoms like nerve pain, trouble with your heart rate, there are medications and treatments your doctors can prescribe. And so I think it'd be important, while we don't have curative therapies, we can certainly make people feel better and, and treat the symptoms, which is important. And so I really thank you for listening to this. Um, and talking about long COVID. Once again, I'm Dr. Michael Brode, and thank you for listening.